to still come in to the house of the Lord to serve and worship him. So uh, we just, we're so glad to see you this morning, praising God, worshiping him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you will, let's get ready to worship our Lord. I'm going to yeah. lower this just a little bit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we just give you praise, honor, and glory as we get ready to enter into worship of you. And I ask you, Lord, just to receive our worship as that living sacrifice you call us to be. And we can only be that through your blood, Jesus. And we thank you. We thank you for everything that you've already done. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. And Lord, we just ask you to receive it now as a, a sweet, sweet sound to your ears. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's just something about that name, huh, sister? Oh, there's just something <laughs> just about something that about name. Just something about that name. <laughs> oh, Jesus. On the worst day, there's something about that name. Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. Ooh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old has been gone. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John 8, 36. Seems like all I could see was the struggle. Oh God, I'm not 
nothing like knowing nothing like knowing that once we've given our heart to him he has redeemed us and in the trials of the day and in the trials of the world just know that no matter what he's there and he's waiting just waiting for you you're redeemed and his redemption on calvary was for each and every one of his children it wasn't just one It was for all, hallelujah, and anyone who will come to him and ask for his redemption, he gives it freely. It's free because he says there's not a work we can do. There is nothing we can do as his children to be redeemed except come to the cross and ask him, Father, I need your redemption in Jesus' name, and it's done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why would I worry? When giants come calling my name My God is so much bigger Than troubles I face Why would I hunger For power or riches or fame It's not needed Because my God is so much better than all of these things. I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I see. They know that the battle is won. Oh, my God is stronger. The victory's already won. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Battle for my ransom.
me tell you, don't start that yet. You see, whenever we're right in the middle of the things in life, there's troubles coming our way. No matter which way the wind is blowing, all we have to do is speak to it. Speak to the mountain, whether it be sickness, whether it be finances, whether it be home, whether it be job, whether it be your family, whether it be an addiction, you speak to the mountain because he says what words we use and speak will be life or death to us. So when that mountain is here and I speak and I tell it, sit down and get quiet in the name of Jesus. Every time I use that name, sister, Jesus, that mountain has to move. It has no choice. And the reason being is because the word of God tells us, speak to the mountain, and that mountain must adhere to what you're saying. If you use the word of God over it, it has no choice. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right. And who is it? He's a way maker, sister. He can keep his promises. (laughs) Yes, he does. Yes, he does. That way. He is always here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, yes, Lord. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. How worship you, how worship you. Bye. 
working even when we don't feel it mm. he's working if you just stop and think about your life and the things that could have happened to us in our lifetime versus what did happen versus where we're at today we know he is the way maker the promise keeper the light in the darkness he never fails us never, never at any point in time will he fail us Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for the opportunity to come to your house and worship you. Lord, we're about to receive gifts and offerings, and we ask that you bless each and every one. Bless each and every person in this building, and especially bless the ones that couldn't make it. There may be some cause or reason, and we just want to say, please, it's a challenge, and you're up for all challenges. Lord, we thank you, and Give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Can you, is it better? Is it working? Okay. All right. Well, apparently for some reason my my mic is not working. We're going to have to check that out later. We'll we'll just look into it. Uh, okay. So uh, anyway, what I was saying is just you know this is it can be taken out of the context of what I what I'm trying to preach in. So just please bear with me in listening to this. And you know so what I want to talk about is being in the world, but not of the world. Can we go? Let's stand for the reading of God's word. First John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask you right now, Lord God, that, Lord, as this word goes forth, and, Lord, sometimes gets to be hard to hear, but, Lord, that your spirit prevails in every heart that's hearing it, God, that, Lord, that they understand that this is given in the light of, Lord, of, of relationship with you, Lord God. That, Lord, that is the most important thing that we could ever do is to build our relationship with you, Lord. And, Lord, that's what we want to do today. Lord, if those that are, are hearing this have not known you as Lord and Savior, that, Lord, that maybe this might bring them, Lord, to that place that they're ready to repent and to come to know you as Lord and Savior, God. So, Father, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. Coming in this place, being part of us, because your word says where two or three are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. Lord, your word also says that, that where you are, the spirit of liberty is there too, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. Too many Christians today, I believe, compromise their faith because they don't want people to think that they are those Christians, those people. The, the, as, when I was in the Navy, we used to be called the Bible thumpers, you know. Uh, but I promise you, I have never taken my st nine-pound Schofield reference Bible and hit anybody over the head with it, okay. And I'm not going to do that now. But because we were so dedicated to what we believed in the Bible, that we were so adamant about living a godly life, we didn't participate in a lot of things that they did. I remember one time we had a chief that was leaving, and uh, my division officer says, Joe, look, I know you don't normally go to these these." parties with us, but I really would need you to go this time, okay? I told him, I said, okay, sir, I'll go. I said, but two conditions. He says, what's that? I says, number one, I'll go, but the minute somebody tells me I need a drink, I'm leaving. He says, okay, done. I said, the second one is, is when everybody starts getting drunk, when they start getting drunk, it's time for me to go. He said, okay. So I went. And we sat there, and we were talking, and we were just shooting the breeze and everything else like that. And then all of a sudden, one of the guys in the, in the, uh, that was in my division, he poured, took the pitcher of beer, and he poured a glass, and he set it in front of me. He said, Joe, if you really want to be part of this division, you need a drink. I looked at my division officer, and I says, sir, that's my cue to leave. And he said, I understand. And as I was leaving, I heard him really chew this other guy out but the thing is is I had to stand on my principles I had to stand on the fact that I am a Christian and I had to be separated from what other people normally do even though it might cause people to look weird on me or, or you know ostracize me or whatever it is but I know whose I am and who it is that I have to please so as Christians, a lot of times we're taught that we can do the same things of the world because we have this thing called grace. And I've talked about this many times, and I don't think grace 
is permission to sin. I've actually even got a book that I wrote that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see about getting it uh, edited so that I can publish it, but it's called, Is Grace Permission to Sin? And it talks about how we have so many times got into the thing that's, oh, well, I can go ahead and do this. I can do whatever it is that, I, that, that everybody else do, and all I have to do is just go repent for it. But is that what grace is about that gives us permission to sin that so we can go back later and repent? Or is grace for when we actually make a mistake that we don't mean to do what it is that we're doing, but something happens that's just like, you know, or we get angry and maybe say a word that we shouldn't say, or we get scared and, and, and say something, or, or maybe we just, you know, do something that's just, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, man, I can't believe I did that. Oh, God, please forgive me, Lord. Please forgive me, God, for doing that. See, that's where grace comes in. Grace, the de very definition of it, is not receiving what we deserve. All right? Just like mercy. Mercy and grace go, go hand in hand. So we have to understand what really is grace and what really is it that we're allowed to do. But what the thing is, is what I'm trying to get here is, is what are we allowed to do in grace you understand what I mean? But we can't cross that line. We don't need to be like the world. We don't need to look like the world and act like the world and smell like the world. We need to be set apart. So, you know, we look at how we act and how we speak. And see, the problem is, is when people do this, they have no concept of the scripture in 2 Corinthians that says, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. All right? He says that we're to come out and be separate. Does that mean that we got to be completely separated from the world and we just stay in our own little corner over here and, and, and not even have contact with the world? No, that's not what he's saying. Because we are in the world, all right? But we can't be part of the world. That means we're in the world and all these things are going around us, but we can't be the participant of the things that we know that are wrong. Jesus was with the sinners. He went to the place where the sinners were. But Jesus did not sin while he was there. All right. And that's what we have to do. We can we can be part of the things we can be there, but we can't be a part of it. We have to be separated from it. So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's not that we cannot not associate with non-believers, but we must, must not act like the non-believers. There has to be a distinction between them who do not call upon the name of the Lord and those of us who do call upon the name of the Lord. See, because I'm going to tell you something. When you tell people you are a Christian, you set yourself up to be viewed under a very tight microscope. They will look for every single thing that you do wrong so that they can say, ha, look, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're doing this. That happened to me one time when I got I got angry and I was in the Navy and I wasn't as strong in the Lord as I am now. I did try not to use foul language when I was there, even though I was a sailor. You know, you know how sailors reputation are, right? But I was trying not to use foul language, but I got angry about something and I said a word that I shouldn't have said. So immediately they were like, and you call yourself a Christian? I didn't have to have God beat me up. I had the devil beat me up for it. But I, what they didn't know is, is I was able to go repent of that. But I was under that tight microscope. And for a while, they didn't want to listen to what I had to say because I called myself a Christian but said a, bad, a word that I shouldn't have said. See, they 
will take every mistake you make and throw it at you in order to keep you off balance. Why? Because that's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to be off balance. He wants to be out of your game. He wants you to be off of your A game, preaching the word of God, telling people how to repent and get saved so that he can keep people in the, uh, in the boundness that he has them in. See, however, most will simply look and see if you have something that they are missing and want a part of. See, when we act all right, and we behave like Christians, people are going to look at us and say, man, through all this that's going on, you seem to have it together. Why? Why is that? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. I don't talk much about what ha what I went through in, in the war, but I can remember one time when 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 things were coming at us. And instead of crying. I was crying out to God. And God gave me a peace through it. And this guy afterwards says, Joe. How can you hold it together? I said, because God told me. That he's oh, he's watching over me. That even though I walk among the lions and the sor scorpions and the serpents, they're under my feet. That if I was to fall, his angels would catch me and bear me up, lest I dash, dash my foot against the stone. I'm going to tell you something. Psalms 91 for a whole year was something that I read every single day. If you're going through a battle, Read Psalms 91. So let's look at how we can differ from non-Christians. The first thing I want to talk about is how do we talk? Now, see, the, one of the things that I've never understood is how someone can claim to be a believer in Christ Jesus, acknowledge that he shed his precious blood for them, yet use that same name in cursing. I mean, it, 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 it's something that I don't understand, you know, that, that we, we, we want to fit in so well that we would use the name of our Lord in vain just so that people don't look at us strangely. Or we think that we're so comfortable in our faith that it's still OK because we have this grace. We have this, I like to call it greasy grace. You know what I mean by greasy grace? See, have you ever been to a, a, to, been to a state fair and, and you see them that they grease up the pig and let the kids run in there and try to catch the greased pig? All right. See, that, that, see that's that greasy grace. All right, I'm talking. See, you just get so lathered up in this grace that as you're in there in the world and, and you're doing all these things and it's trying to hold on to you, that you just slip right through it and you slide right into heaven because you have this greasy grace on you, right? But that's not how it works, all right? Because the Bible says that if we willfully do things that we know that are wrong, then there is no more remission of sins. Because we cannot crucify him again on the cross. So how can we be sliding our way into heaven, you know, like like a baseball runner going to a home and just slide right on in. All right, on this grace, knowing that we're doing things that is against the word of God. We can't. Ephesians. 29 and 30 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Now, I want to interject on this here. Corrupt word. What does corrupt word mean? Not only does it mean cursing, but what about bad mouthing somebody? All right. I, 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 I got this not too long ago. I had to call Pastor Rachel that I was making some comments about somebody in a coarse, joking way. All right with my partner at work. And I even said, I, I was on, on the phone with Pastor Rachel, and, and I said the same thing, and she got quiet. And after we hung up, 
the Lord spoke to me. Here I am. I'm supposed to be setting the example to my partner. I'm supposed to be setting the example to my wife and to my family. How can I be in coarse joking, talking about somebody like this? I had to repent. All right. I called her up and I told her, I said, man, I said, the Lord just got me. And I had to repent. But see, that's the corrupt words that proceed out of our mouth. We said, instead of having the corrupt words, he says, but what is good and necessary for what? Edification. You know what edification means? To build up, not to tear down. See, I was tearing down by the words that I said. I was tearing down this man's character. Okay? I was not edifying him. I was not edifying my partner. I was not edifying my wife. I was not edifying my spirit. And I had to repent. He says, but what's good in this for edification? That it made him part grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Wow. See, when we let coarse and corrupt words come out of our mouth, then we're showing ourselves no different than the world. We're being part of the world, not just in the world. See, there's no plain way to look at it but then Ephesians 5, 4. It says, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking, wow, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Let's go back to Ephesians 30 for just a second. Can you go back to that one for me? There you go, right there. It says, now what I want you to look at in this one here, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Wow, does that mean that we can grieve the Holy Spirit? We absolutely can. We grieve the Holy Spirit by the way we act and the way we talk, that it does not show the people that he lives within us. We need to show the world that he lives with. Jesus was talking to his disciples. He said, nobody lights a lamp. Well, that means a candle, right? Because back in the days, they didn't have a, a light to turn on. But he says, nobody lights a light. And puts it underneath the bushel. But they put it up on the lampstand where it gives what? Light to the whole room. The Holy Spirit is the light that is within us. Do we hide it under a bushel so that nobody knows it's inside of us? Or do we put it up on the lampstand and let the whole world see that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us? That there's a light that they can come to that they don't have to grope around in the darkness. I remember one time I was at work and I got in trouble. This, this person I was working with went to my bo- went to our, our boss and said that um, all I keep doing is preaching. Well, I wasn't preaching to her, but when people in the back of the ambulance, you know, are talking to me and they say, pray for me. Don't think I'm for a second. I'm not going to say, no, I can't do that. I'm at work. I pray for them. All right. I'm a Christian and I'm a chaplain at work. That's what I do. Well, this person didn't like it. So my my boss at the time, uh, he says, he says, Joe, look, he says, we know you're a Christian. He says, just like I look at that lamp over there, and I know that that is a lamp because the light's on. He says, so people know you're a Christian. You don't have to keep telling everybody all the time. I don't tell everybody. But I don't have to walk into a room and know that the lamp is on because I see the light that's coming from it. Amen. That was like, man, I tell you, I walked out of there and the Holy Spirit told me to see your lamp is on the lampstand and people see that. Wow. He might have meant it for, for to, to get me to tell me correct for correction. But the Holy Spirit told me I was doing the right thing. So we have to let people see the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we don't grieve him. See, when we are cursing, we do not let people see Jesus, but only the world. When we are, of course, joking, we don't let people see Jesus, 
only the world. See, we claim to be a Christian, but what does our mouth show? Look at James 30, 10 through 12. It says, out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. We have to have either blessings or cursing coming out of our mouth. Which one comes out of our mouth? He goes on and he says, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt and fre- uh, salt water and fresh. So how do you know which way you are listening to Jesus' words? Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. But an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaks. How is our words? That's what tells us what's in our heart. That's what tells us how our heart is. What words come out of our mouth? How do we speak? When we get, when we get upset, do we immediately go to acting like the world does? Or do we immediately start, i got to pray about this. When things are coming against us, when things are seeming to weigh heavy on us, do we start acting like the world does? Or do we start praying about it? You know, recently, with, with all that's going on with my job and everything, and a lot of people have already been told about this, that, you know, the, the aimless company I'm working with, Harrison County, is not going to use them anymore. So I was wondering how I was going to, to do, what, I was gonna, what was I going to do? So Pastor Rachel and I decided we're just going to pray about this. We're going to ask God to open up every door that needs to be opened and close every door that needs to be closed. And the reason she played Waymaker today, or did, or they sung Waymaker today, is because I was going to work, and I asked the Lord. I says, "Lord, I need your guidance. I need you to show me what to do. I don't know which way to go." And in my mind, Waymaker came came to my mind, and then all of a sudden, started playing on the radio on K Love, and I knew that God was the Waymaker. So, see, I don't have to worry like the world does. But because I trust in him and he's in my heart, his light lights the way for me and where I need to go. But see, when we and when we let only the wholesome things come out of our mouth, we allow people to see Jesus in us because of a good heart. Amen. Did that cut off again? Okay. Second thing I want to talk about is what do we watch and listen to? I want to go back to Luke 6.45. It says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need to look at where does a person get the treasures of a good or evil heart? Simply, what do you watch and listen to? What do you watch and listen to? See, it's been said that our minds are the greatest computer that has ever been developed. That's how we know that we weren't just an accident. Because you don't, nobody accidentally created the computer, right? It was specifically designed for a specific purpose, and that's why we have computers like we have today. But even as great as they are today, the greatest supercomputer cannot compare to our mind. But we know this. Out of the greatest computers, the only thing you're going to get out of a computer is what you put into it. You're, you program a computer by what you put into it, right? You put the formulas and you put all the, all the, the, uh, all the information and everything else in the, into this computer so that you can get this information out. We know that NASA does not put in grandma's biscuit recipe so they can get the right formula for rocket fuel out of it, right? K-12 
Because if you only put grandma's biscuit recipe into the computer, what are you going to get out of that computer? Grandma's biscuit recipe. All right? So what are you putting into your computer? How do you put things into your computer? Simply by the things that you watch and that you listen to. The TV programs that you watch. Are you watching TV programs that are full of violence and cussing and, and, and all kinds of evil stuff? You know, that's got uh, witches and warlocks and, and, and all kinds of demonic stuff in it. Is that what you're watching? Well, that's what you're putting into your computer. Are you listening to the music that belittles people and cuts people down and is using a language that we wouldn't even allow uh, on the air, what, 10 years ago that, that's coming all over the air nowadays in it? But guess what? That's what you're going to have in your mind. That's what's going to be in your heart. That's what's going to come out of your mouth. You can't help it because if you program it that way, you cannot get anything else out of it. One time at work, well, I've actually had several people at work, they told me, they say, Joe, one thing that I want to hear you do is cuss one time. Just say one cuss word, just one. I say, well, I'm sorry. I can't. They're like, why? I said, because it's not in me. Then in order for the cuss to come out, the cuss has to be in. Pastor Rachel and I decided six, seven years ago that we wouldn't even watch our favorite program, The Golden Girls, because of the language. We used to have this thing that was called a, um, help me, help me watch this, what was it called? Not, not clear play, but it was, um. Guardian, uh, TV Guardian, TV Guardian. But now that with everything being streaming, the TV Guardian isn't there anymore. Because what it is, you hooked it to your, your cable box as it came in, and when it read a curse word, it would mute it so that you didn't have to hear the curse words. But now that it's all streaming, th they don't have that anymore. So we just decided not, to, just not to watch it. Because why? We know that what we put into the computer is going to come out of the computer. Amen. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it, out of what? Your heart springs the issues of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So how do we keep our hearts pure? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Abstain from every form of evil. Also look at Psalms 101.3. says, I will, not, I, will not, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. This goes before our ears as well too. See, we have to make a conscious choice. What are we, how are we going to program our computer? How are we going to program it so that we get out of it what we want out of it and not get out of it what we don't want out of it? Simply put, not only are we not going to not program our computer with the wicked things, but we need to program our computer, our mind, with the godly things. We need to be in our Bible, reading our Bible, listening to our Bible, listening to messages of the Word of God. I uh, talk to Pastor Rachel every morning. I say, babe, what you doing this morning? She says, you know, I'm listening to Mama Joyce, or I just got through listening to Mama Joyce. Now I'm listening to James Robinson, or, you know, every Saturday morning we get up and we put John Hagee on. And see, these are the things that feed our computer to the things that we want to come out of our computer. Amen? And see, that's what we have to do. We have to train our mind the way that it should go. You know, I remember one time before Rachel, Pastor Rachel and I got married, I had all, probably over about 500 or so uh, DVDs and VHS tapes. And, I mean, I had every, I was, I was a bachelor. My house was a bachelor pad. All right? As a matter of fact, when she walked in, the first thing she walked in my house, she looked around, she goes, Oh, God, I couldn't live like this. Well, I mean, here, I'll, I'll explain it to you here in a minute. I had uh, the, the trailer that I lived in. I had a, the rug started off as a maroon rug, but over the time of, of sunlight and trafficking and all like that, it turned more like a pink. All right. 
or a mauve, I, I think is what it was, you know, but it was supposed to have been room. And I had this, I had this shelf. When you walked into the door, there was a shelf right there that I had made, and it had all kinds of ceramic things that I had made on it, you know. And uh, then I had a, the, uh, my DVD shelf and uh, my TV. My TV was too big for my TV stand, you know, one of them floor TV stands. So I put it up on top of the TV stand, and I took where the TV is supposed to go, and I built another shelf and had all kinds of stuff on it. I had, so I had uh, white curtains with a mauve rug. I had a blue recliner and a green couch, okay? <laughs> so it was a bachelor pad because, you know, only bachelors can go down the road and see a, see a chair sitting on the side of the road and go, ooh, new furniture, and go get it, okay? Hey, I'm going to tell you something, ladies. Us guys, I'm going to tell you something about us guys that, you know, you, you you look at the aesthetics of things, you know, only a woman will wear shoes that hurt her feet and complain about it, but yet won't get rid of them because they look good. All right. Men, we look at the functionality. I don't care if the blue cow, uh, rug, I mean, the blue chair don't go with the green couch and the, and the mauve rug. Okay. It functions. I sit in it. I lean my feet up in it. I can sit, lay back and take a nap. That's all we care about. Okay. So, ladies, understand something about our men. But anyway, well, I had all these. I, like I said, I had a bachelor pass. So I had all of these. I mean, every uh, just about every sports action movie you can ever think of. All right. And one day, I was looking at something I wanted to watch, <coughs> and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and He said. How many of these movies would you sit down with your pastor and watch? I had some that I would not do that because they had language in them. They had, they had scenes that I shouldn't be watching in them. And I says, Lord, he says, why would you watch them with me? I went through every single one of them. And if they had something in there that I didn't want to sit down and watch this with Jesus, I got rid of it. I had very few left after that. Not that we don't have it built back up, but they're all good movies now. All right. I found Christian bookstore and, and, and Christian, what was that, that Christian cinema thing and all that. And, and we're, that's where we're getting our movies from now. So, But I had to get rid of them because... I didn't want to sit down with Jesus and watch these. Why? Because just like Joshua said in Deuteronomy 31, 60, he says, Do not be dismayed, for I am with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Wherever you go, be strong and of good courage. Wow. He is with me. And I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. The third thing I want to talk about is what do you do? There's a phrase that I used to always say, and I still use this as actions speak louder than words. Meaning that what we do, what people see us do, what people hear us say, these actions speak a lot, a lot louder than anything that we can preach to them. That's why we have made the, the uh, Pastor Rachel and I have made the decision. We're not going to we're not going to go places where people say, well, I, you know, look, there's Pastor Joe and Pastor Rachel there. It's OK for us to go there and fall into sin. Even though it's not sinful for us, we don't want them to fall into that sin. Amen. So what are some of the things that I'm going to talk about here today? And and, and you know, I, I, if, if I get a little personal just remember, this is the Lord wants to get personal with you on this. This is not me, okay? The first thing I want to talk about is smoking. Do you smoke? Cameron. All right. See, I used to smoke, and, and I used to fall under this thing as well. God hadn't convicted me of it, so I'm just going to keep on smoking. But I, I felt that to smoke at the church was wrong because, I mean, you know, that, that's the church, you know. So I, I didn't want to smoke at the church, but I still smoke. The church I was going to at the time, I was like, a, I guess you could call the youth leader. We were a real small church, just like this one is here now. 
And just kind of like how we have just a, a, you know, a few kids here. We had a few kids like that of all the ages, and all the ages came to me. And I taught them, tried, you know, tried to teach them all where we, all of them could understand what I was doing. And I was going to the store one day, and I got out of, I was getting, fixing to get out of my van, and I was smoking a cigarette. And these kids knew what my van looked like, so they all come running up to my van. And as I'm getting ready to get out with a cigarette, I saw the hurt look on their faces. God not only convicted me, but he crushed me. I said, I went, I, I just got back in my van. I backed out. I didn't even get what I needed to get. I just drove home. I got on my face before the Lord. I said, God, you know I can't do this. I says, but your word says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, your word that says that there's no temptation which is, which is given to man that you don't provide a way out. So, Lord, this is the deal. You know, if you heard my testimony, I like making deals with God. All right. But I says, this is the deal, God. I says, I will pray. Every time I feel the urge to smoke a cigarette, I will pray till you take that urge away from me. And let me tell you something. For the first three months, me and God did some heavy-duty talking. All right. But that's been almost 30 years ago since I've smoked a cigarette since. Amen. So. What comes in my mind to me when I see people claim to be Christian smoking? I think about this. Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Or do you know that your body, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have found from God, from whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So do, do I want the Holy Spirit to live in a smoky temple? You know, do I want him to, to come into a temple that I mean, you know, I was in the casino the other day uh, going to get in a patient from I was at work when I'm, I'm in uniform in the casino. You know, I'm working. OK, but I went in there and as I walked in this casino, the, the smoke immediately just started burning my throat and I was coughing because of it and I'm thinking to myself this is not what the Holy Spirit wants to live in he don't want to live in this kind of a temple I know smoking is something that gets a grip on you but I also know that we have a God who will take it from you if you give it to him a God that says that no matter what you are against, no matter what you're facing, no matter what temptation comes your way, I can get you through it if you trust and rely upon me. And that's what I did. One of the things I said, Lord, when I was praying, I said, Lord, I said, I want to don't want to. If I ever get around smoke, Lord, it just it just makes me sick. And it does. It gives me a headache now. I got what I asked for. The second thing I want to talk about is drinking. Now, I'm not talking about the one glass of beer or the one glass of wine with dinner. But what I am talking about is the drinking in the bar or the partying and getting drunk. I have heard arguments about, well, Jesus drank wine. As well as those who say, well, the wine that Jesus drank was non-alcoholic grape juice. No matter which way you believe, I want to point out this, Ephesians 5, 8. It says, and do not be drunk with wine, which is in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So why does Paul warn the Ephesians about getting drunk? Well, let me explain something to you, and I'm explaining to you from a medical point of view as well, too, okay? Because many of you know that I'm a paramedic and I know about this. When we get drunk or we take drugs... All right. And I, and I got a brother and a sister here that, that uh, come to see our listen to their testimony. Their testimony is powerful about where God has taken them out from drugs and everything. OK. All right. But when we but when we're drunk or we're on drugs, we don't have control of our mind anymore. We yield control of our mind to the drugs and to the alcohol. And it becomes an open door for the enemy to come in. And set up precedents. Let me tell you something. As a Christian, okay, you have a closed door 
to your spirit from the enemy. However, listen to me carefully. However, if you open that door to the enemy and to your spirit and to your mind, he will gladly come in uninvited. See, Jesus we have to invite. You ever seen the picture uh, of, of Jesus knocking on the door? All right. You know, and it comes from in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, 20. says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock at anyone who invites me in. All right. Jesus has to. But I want you to notice something about that door. Go back and look. Uh, look, look at, if you have a picture in your house, look at it. If not, you can look at it on the Internet. One thing I want you to notice is there is no doorknob on that door on the outside of the door. Jesus cannot grab that doorknob, open that door, and walk in. Jesus will not come in where he's not been invited. You have to invite the Holy Spirit into where you are at. You have to invite the whole, uh, You have to invite Jesus into your heart because he will not take what you're not willing to give him. But the enemy, on the other hand, will take what you're not willing to give him. He, he's, the, uh, John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. All right? He will come in and he will take it. And if we open that door to him, he will gladly walk in and rob you blind. So we have to close that door. We close that door by not letting our mind be open to the things of the demonic activity. We close our mind by not letting him have access to us. Drinking, getting drunk and getting and, and drugs is that open door that he will use. The third thing I want to talk about is, is where do you go? See, one thing I've, I've never understood about those who speak of the greatness of God become Sunday morning. Where are they? Oh, there was a sale on at the store and, 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 and I wanted to be the first one in line to get to it. You know, oh, oh man, my, my football team was playing and, and see, we wouldn't have been out of church before the game started. And, and I want to I want to watch the whole game, you know. Oh, the races were on and, you know, I wanted to see who had pole position so I couldn't be there. Now, I'm not talking about people who are drunk. I mean, uh, excuse me, who are. People who are sick is what I meant to say. I'm not talking about people who are sick. OK, I'm talking about people who just choose not to come. We, we got some out today that has already texted me and said. Pastor, I can't be there. We're, we're fighting the crud. We don't want to give it to everybody else. Amen, brother, sister. We're praying for you. You know, we, we've, we've got some that's probably not listened to us online today because they're making funeral arrangements for, for their father. Brother, sister, we're praying for you. Okay. But I'm talking about people who make a choice not to come to church because this was more important than God. This was more important than God. Something else is more important than God. But see, when the Lord comes, we want to say, oh, yeah, I want to be raptured. I want to be the first one taken up in the cloud. But you can't put God first. So where do you go? What do you do? What is more important than being in church? You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, I just stay home because I'm, I'm watching on on a live uh, Facebook live and or watch it on YouTube. And, you know, that, that's I, I get I get to church that way. But the thing is, I want to warn you about that is, yes, you're you're getting the word of God and you're putting God first and that. But you're not in the herd where the enemy can't come at you like he does when we're separated. You know, we've spoken about this so many times. That if you watch, you know, uh, I know I keep referring to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom because that's what I grew up with. And I'm dating my age. I'm dating myself and telling you how old I am by this. But, you know, I know there's other programs now. There's, there's, there's like National Geographic Channel that does this and all like that. But when the lions are in the plains and, and you know, and they're hunting, they don't go and attack the whole herd. 
they, what they do is, is they find the one that is getting away from the herd, that is venturing away and saying, oh, I'm going to go eat this grass over here. And then they come in and they start pushing this one further and further and further from the herd. And while there's a bunch of them drive the herd over this way, and then when this one deer, antelope, gazelle, zebra, whatever it is, get so far away from the herd that there's no hope of getting back into the herd, what happens? Lunchtime. And that's what it becomes. I want to read something for you here that, that the Lord has, has to, uh, had put in my heart earlier this morning. And, and Cameron, you ain't got to try to look for this. It's not on a slide, okay? It's 1 Peter 5, 8. And if you have your Bibles, I would just invite you to, 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 to highlight this, underline it, circle it, do whatever it is. God does not get upset that you write in your Bible, okay? It says, it says 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And when we're not in the church, when we don't have the brothers and sisters to stand beside us, when we don't have the people praying over us when we're going through the times of difficulty in our lives, when we're going through the times of hurt in our lives, when we're going through the trials in our lives, when we don't have somebody standing beside us, the devil can run over us like a Mack truck. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to come into your life. He wants to steal, kill, and to destroy. Amen? That's why Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And then look at what he says here. He says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as some. All right. Not forsaking means don't forsake. Don't turn away from the assembling of ourselves. You know, and this thing about COVID, we had the greatest challenge to the church and probably the history of the church since they were hiding in caves to have church because the Roman, the Roman soldiers were trying to find them to kill them, right? And it was called COVID, where we had the government actually shutting down churches. And to be honest with you, a lot of churches have never recovered from that. Why? Because the people says, oh, I'll just watch it on Facebook or I'll watch it on YouTube. I can sit at home in my comfy living room and watch. But what normally happens? Come on, let's face it. What happens when you're sitting down watching a movie? How many times do you get up because something gets your attention? Or the phone beeps and you got a text message. Or you got a Facebook message. Or you got something or a phone call comes or something like that. See, in church we're good about shutting our phones off. But at home we leave them on, right? And the devil will do everything he can to distract you while you're at home from listening to the preacher that's on the TV. I know this because on Saturday morning, sometimes I got to rewind Pastor Hagee to hear kids what it is he said because something got my attention. The dog got my attention or, or something came up on the phone or something in the, in the house or something. You know what? Something always can get your attention and drag you away from it. But when we're together, when we don't forsake the assembly, he says, but we can exhort one another. Exhort one another means when we get together, that when I see my brother, I see my sister is in trouble. I see that something's going on in their life and that I can pray with them. I can lay hands on them. You know, if there's sickness in their life, if, if whatever it is, I can lay hands on them and I can pray with them. Where two or three agree upon one thing. Jesus says, uh, asking it of the Father that the Son may be glorified, it will be given to you. But how if you don't have somebody with you doing that, how can it be given to you? We got to come together. We got to have the herd mentality. Do you know why the lion does not attack the whole herd? Because there's too many horns and hooves in the herd. They know they're going to get hurt. They know they're going to get trampled on. They're going to get kicked. All right? When we're together and we're praying together and we're exhorting one another and we're lifting one another up and we're sharing one another's burdens, then guess what? We're kicking the devil down and we're stepping on his head. But you can't do it by yourself. 
you got to have the herd mentality. Amen. My question is, what if Jesus thought something was more important than going to the uh, Jesus thought something was more important than going to the cross? What if it became time for him to go to the cross and he said, oh, wait, Father, I can't go to the cross right now. The saints are playing. I got to watch the saints. Or, Lord, the angels are playing in the pennant. I got to watch the angels. That's baseball for those that don't know that. All right. Or what if it was his, 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 his famous race car driver? And if he wins this race, he wins the championship. What if that was on Jesus' mind and kept him from going to the cross? Where would we be? I know this is, message is a little hard for some people. But I think this is what the Holy Spirit wanted y'all to hear. The third thing I want to talk about is, is our choices has consequences or blessings. Every choice we make in life has consequences or blessings, not just in the spiritual realm but even in the natural realm as well, too. If I choose to lie to my wife about something and she finds out about it, I've got consequences, right? And let me tell you something. It's a whole lot easier to just tell the truth and take a little, a little bit of fussing at because you will never remember the lie that you told. But husbands, listen to me, she will. For a very long time. Okay. And you will hear about it for a very long time. But when you tell the truth. And just get into a little bit of trouble. You know. Like I was moving something on one of the shelves. In our, in our, on our, our uh, counter in the living room. And I knocked a uh, candle over. And broke it. It's a glass candle. One of her favorite candles. So immediately I told her about it. And I says, I just wanted to let you know that I, it was me that did this. I did this. I'm sorry. And she goes, well, it was just a candle. But uh, see, if I would have lied about it, well, I don't know what happened to it. Then she would have learned the truth because it was just me and her in the house. The do and, and the only dog that runs around is my little Shih Tzu, and he wasn't able, tall enough to knock it over. So the truth would have been known. I'd have been in a lot of trouble, right? I'd have had consequences to face for a while, all right? But our choosing in the spiritual realm also has consequences or blessings. See, when we choose not to do what God has required of us, we are in danger of hearing this, what he said in Matthew 25, 41. He says, then I will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, and to the everlasting fire prepare for the devil and his angels. Is that really what you want to hear? But when we don't do what he requires of us, all right, see, you remember I said this here before. A lot of people say, well, the Bible is just a book of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. What can you really do, right? Well, see, I look at the Bible as a book of do's. Do this and be blessed. Do that and be blessed. Do this and find favor with the Lord. Do that and the Lord will be with you. So if I do all the do's, I don't have time to do the don'ts, but even if I did, I wouldn't, so it's cool, right? But if I did the don'ts, then I have run in real danger of being told this, right? Because remember, we don't have the greasy grace that greases us all up and lets us slide right into heaven. All right? That's not what it's about. You know? I mean, some of them, I think that, you know, they, they, they want to get to heaven by swinging through hell first. And then they get to heaven smelling like smoke. You know? I, I don't want that to be me. 
But see, the thing is, is what I do know is that if I do the do's and not do the don'ts, then what I will hear is Matthew 25, 23, when he says, Lord, and his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Hallelujah. See, that's what I want here. I want want Jesus to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I don't want to get up to the gates of heaven and wonder if I'm allowed to go in or not. Because God, I'm going to tell you something. St. Peter is not the bell man that looks up the book and says if your name is on the roll or not. That's just a cartoon concept. Okay? What it is is we're going to stand before the Lord one day, and every bit of our life is going to be played from the moment we were born, from the time we took our first breath to the time that we took our last breath, and we're going to be accountable for it. All the things that I know that I've already asked Jesus to forgive me for is already wiped clean. It's covered by the blood. When we get to that part, all it's going to be red on the screen because it's covered by the blood. But the things that's not covered by the blood because I thought I'd get greasy grace, it's going to be there. And Axel Grease ain't going to get me into heaven, I promise you. All right? So we have to look forward to that well done, good, and faithful servant. Yes, I am saying that Christians can be lost again. All right? Not that God takes away our salvation. And see, this is where I, I, I disagree with my brothers and my sisters that believe in the eternal salvation, that all you got to do is say a prayer, get dunked in water, and your ticket's punched, okay? Because the Bible does say that those who have tasted of the Lord and known the goodness thereof and depart from it, there is no remission of sin. It's clean cut, all right? We got to do what God wants us to do. What does the Bible say to do? What does the Bible say to, how does the Bible say to speak? What does the Bible say to act? How does the, where does the Bible say that we should go and we should not go? I want to read this little story for you in closing. In 1865, a lighthouse tender became angry with his town for, for their supporting of ending slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation of President Abraham Lincoln. He therefore decided he was not going to go to the lighthouse and light the lighthouse that night. It was a stormy night without any moonlight. A ship was trying to get to harbor carrying wounded men from battle. Without the lighthouse, the captain could not get a fix on the safe port. Knowing that without getting these men to port and getting these men to the hospital, most of them would die, the captain attempted to navigate to the port. The ship did not make it to port. Instead, it crashed on the rocky shoals with the loss of all lives on board. When the lighthouse tender was informed of the mishap and the name of the ship, he broke down weeping. His son was the captain of that ship. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all all things become new. Yes, we are in this world, but not of this world. When we become followers of Christ, we put everything else behind us. Please stand with me. And I'm sorry that scripture was not Matthew, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, my mistake. Maybe today was a wake-up call for you. Maybe it was a revelation, a new way to look at things. If you are here or you're on Facebook Live or you're on YouTube and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today can be your day. Today can be the day that you begin the right path where you will hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Maybe you've been a Christian before and, and, and you've, you've wondered from that path and, and, and some of the things that we talked about today, you said, 
Lord, I need to repent of that. Today's the day to repent. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, oh, 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 and he is just to forgive us of our sins and not just forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So if that's you today, I, I just want to ask you, if you want to come up for prayer, and we would be more than happy to pray for you. If you got something going on in your life that you need a brother, you need a sister to come and pray with you, to agree with you that God's going to just work it out, I just want to invite you to come up and, and let us lay hands on you and let us pray with you. If you're online, if you're on Facebook Live or you're on YouTube and you got a challenge in your life or, or you want to come to Christ or, or rededicate your life to Christ, just just all you got to do is just pray with us and just send me a little note to say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to pray with you. If that's you, if you want to accept Jesus or we come back to Jesus, just pray with me. Just say, Jesus, today I lay down my life for you. I ask you to come into my heart to cleanse me from all the things that are unrighteous, all the things that I've done wrong. Forgive me and cleanse me. Lord, I ask you to lead me, to guide me, to direct me in every area of my life. What I say, what I watch, what I listen to, where I go. That, Lord, one day you will say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I thank you for saving me and cleansing me according to your word and your promise. In Jesus' name. Make this song part of your prayer. Oh, Jesus, we just ask you right now, Lord, to have your way in us, Lord. Lord, here we are. We raise up our hands in the surrender to you, oh, Lord. Lord, we want to be a Jesus pleaser, not a people pleaser. God, when people look at us, Lord, we want them to see you, Lord God. Lord, we want to be like those that were in Corinth, Lord God. When the people of Corinth looked at them and says, you must be Christians for you emulate the very person that you're speaking about. Lord, let us be that reflection, God. That people see you and know that they need you, God. Lord, that when they see us, that they know that there's something missing in their life. And that they can come to you, Lord. Because your word says that, Lord, if you are lifted up, that you will draw all men to yourself, God. Lord, let us be that viewport that they see you lifted up, God. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives right now, God. The mighty work that you're doing. Lord, 
we just want to praise you today. Lord, have your way in us, Lord. Have your way in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. If you would just raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you in all your ways. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and through you and that he is gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his conscience upon you and give you his peace. You may go in Jesus name. Amen.